Now, uh, I have to say, not many people agree with me. Most people believe that verse 36 refers to everything following. So let's look at that. I've already told you that that, that verse 36 could refer to the second coming, the rapture of the new heaven and the, and the new earth. And let's be honest, they may be right. I don't know. This is only what I believe. I'm telling you what I honestly believe in my heart. All right? I believe the new heaven and the new earth uh, is, is what's being referred to um, in Matthew 24, 36. Um, I actually believe that Matthew 24, 36 couldn't possibly refer, refer to either the rapture or the second coming. And I'll tell you why. According to the Bible, Christians will know, listen to this carefully, according to the Bible, Christians will know the approximate date of the rapture. Now where does it say that? This is my personal interpretation. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm, I'm putting, I'm <laughs> putting my, um, I do have a little bit of a speaking ministry. I travel around, around the world. Um, I may be completely wrong on this, in which case I'm going to look really silly. However, I have studied this very carefully and I think I should, I should give you the benefit of what I actually believe. There are four occasions when believers actually knew there's one occasion when the believers actually knew when the rapture was going to be, and three other occasions when Jesus makes it quite clear that believers will know roughly when the rapture is going to be. So let's look at them in detail. First of all, the rapture in the Bible, the, the famous one, of course, is the rapture of Elijah, and that's in 2 Kings 2, verse 3. Okay? Let's read the actual scripture. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel, came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Right, well, what does that mean? It means that on that day, all the believers knew the exact day when Elijah would be taken up to heaven in a, in a chariot of fire. All right? So Jesus implies that... Um, oh, sorry, we're moving on to the next one now, which is in Revelation 3.3. 3. And in this one, Jesus implies that believers who are awake will know the approximate time of the rapture. Just look at what the actual text says. This is Jesus talking to the church in Sardis. Jesus says the, talks to the church in Sardis, and this is what he says. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Think about it. What is Jesus saying? He says, if you don't watch, I'll, um, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour will come upon you. Which implies, of course, if you think about it, that believers who watch will know the hour that Jesus is coming back. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. Jesus actually, we've already covered this once, but let's, it is, it's relevant here as well. In Matthew 16, verse 3, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they were not able to, to discern the signs of the times. The implication, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, is that believers should be able to discern the signs of the times. The believers should be able to know roughly when Jesus is coming back. And let's look at this very important scripture here. Paul said that the rapture would not come as a thief in the night for children of the light. Now, in the first part, we looked at what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 all about the rapture, and he goes on in 1 Thessalonians 5 to say concerning the times and the dates. That's actually what he says. He says concerning the times and the dates. But hit, look at this, what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not... Sorry. So, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the, di of the day. So what's Paul saying here? Paul implies that believers will not be surprised by the rapture and will be eagerly anticipating it. That's, in, that's quite a rele revelation to some people. Paul's actually saying here that believers will be, uh, be eagerly anticipating the rapture and that day will not overtake them like a thief. Which is why I don't think personally, that Matthew 24, 36, when Jesus is saying, of the day and the hour, nobody knows it, I don't believe it can be referring to the rapture, because elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus makes it perfectly clear, either Jesus or Paul, that believers would know. So, conclusion, for people who are watching and waiting, the coming of the Lord will not come like a thief in the night. Now, it doesn't mean we will know the exact time and the exact 
day and hour? Of course we won't. I don't know the exact time, time and hour, but I, I do believe that we will know an approximate time cell. Emphasis on approximate. All right. Now let's look at this. Approximate dates. This is very important. Approximate dates. God frequently gives exact dates to his people. Clear indication of what's going to happen. For example, Abraham was told that the children of Israel would be in slavery under Pharaoh for exactly 400 years. That's an exact time scale. All right. We've looked at this one already in 2 Kings 2. Elijah, Elisha and the prophets all knew the very day that Elijah would be taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. Here's an example in Jeremiah chapter 29, also 25 as well. God told Jeremiah that the Jews would be in captivity in Babylon for how long? Exactly 70 years. What about this one? Daniel 9.25. It prophesies the exact date of Jesus' first coming to Jerusalem, AD 33. Now, we haven't got time to go into Daniel's 70 weeks, which is really important scripture, but that is covered on another teaching, which is called the Bible is Supernatural. So I'm not missing out on Daniel's 70 weeks. There just isn't time to talk about it here. Now, in Mark 8.31, Jesus prophesied that he would rise from the dead. How long? After three days. That's an exact time scale. In Matthew 26.34, Jesus prophesied that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. That's within the next few hours, wasn't it? In Daniel 9.27, it foretells that Antichrist will break a seven-year treaty, there's one time scale, with Israel. How long? After three and a half years. That's another time scale. And in Revelation 20, verse 4, it's prophesied that Jesus will rule on earth how long? For 1,000 years. Those are all very exact time scales, aren't they? Now, we're going to look at exactly how old this universe is. Now, this is mostly on my teaching on creation and evolution, but we need to know for this study how old the universe is as well. So let's go there. We can do some simple mathematics and find out roughly how old the universe is. All right, let's do that. We need to do some detective work to find out when the universe was created. Jesus said very importantly, he said the same thing but in different Gospels, in different ways. He said in Mark 10 verse 6, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. What's Jesus saying? Adam and Eve were created when? At the beginning of the creation. Matthew 19.4, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Again, Adam and Eve were created at the beginning. Right? So, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, the universe was created on day 1, and Adam and Eve were created on day 6. Six days apart, six literal days, all right? Now, Dr. Luke was a medical doctor. I used to be a medical doctor myself. But anyway, Dr. Luke was much more important than me, and he recorded, in Luke chapter 3, the ancestors of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go through all that long list. Take it from me, there are 77 generations uh, from God through Adam down to Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, uh, Jesus Christ is the 77th uh, generation from Adam. All right? And you might recognize some of these names, Jesus, Joseph, Isaac, Abraham, Noah, Methuselah, Seth, Adam, and others. All right? And it says, by the way, in Luke 3.38, that Adam was the son of God. He was not the son of a monkey. I was speaking in a, in, a, in a church the other day, and the minister got really cross with me because I was talking about creation, not evolution. And I said, look, in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, it says that Adam was the son of God, not the son of a monkey. Anyway, there are 77 generations from God through Adam, Seth, and all the others down to Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know roughly, in this context, we don't know how long a generation is, and it doesn't actually greatly matter. Um, I've actually chosen 50 years because the patriarchs, as you probably know, live longer than we do now. So, I've chosen, if you look at the screen, 77 generations we know, and I've chosen a rough 50 years. This is approximate. Everything's very approximate. 50 years, that makes 3,850 years. 77 generations, 50 years each, comes to 3,850 years. This is approximate, so that's roughly 4,000 years. So, from um, 